Welcome to Navigating Change, the podcast from Tybal Education. I'm Pete Wright, and I'm very excited about our guest today. We've got Matthew Loon. He's got over 25 years' experience creating stories and characters at Pixar, The Simpsons, and beyond. Now, we met Matthew at uh, Nakubo this year, right? One of the most unlikely places, but the the best place. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, in one conference, it's uh, Kamau Bell. Jane Fonda and Matthew Lunn. That was oh. quite a uh, quite a. Did, you did know this, right, Matthew? That you were uh, you were in that in that group. No, I didn't. <laughs> you did not. Wow. Oh yeah. Yeah. All right. That's an auspicious yeah. group, Matthew. And so we we say with the greatest reverence, welcome to Navigating Change. Okay. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure being here. You just had a wonderful book come out called "The Best Story Wins." I love this endorsement from James Carnes. Vice President of Adidas Strategy. I'm going to read it. Read this book to become a better storyteller. Captivate your audience. Reach people deep down. Rare brilliance, and yet so simple and fun. Learn to connect on a deeper level to any audience, consumers, clients, higher education leaders. I added that one, by the way, Matthew. (laughs) Okay. Extreme intelligence delivered with pure enjoyment. Brilliance, extreme intelligence. Your parents must be quelling at this point. Wow. You know, I really should have read that endorsement closer because that that should have been on the front of the book. I really am upset now. It's unbelievable. Rare brilliance. That's what you want in your book. I don't know if my parents would say that, but that's that's what James from Adi Daz said. So that makes me happy. (laughs) Absolutely. So first of all, I want to talk about this title. The best story wins. You know, I have to admit that the title caught me off guard. And without naming names, let's talk about the losers. All right, just for a minute. <laughs> okay. <laughs> See, the best story wins presumes that there's a loser in these conversations. So without saying any specific people, when you say the best story wins, describe a loser in this domain. Like I'm like what does it mean to be a lose to lose in the conversation, right? Well, I would say that I mean that's really harsh when you put it that way. <laughs> But, well, this is know, just the beginning. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but you know, it's like, isn't it? It's interesting when you have two people making basically the same pitch with the same content, but one person uh, is able to captivate the audience and another one doesn't. I mean, you can even see it in movies. Like, remember when, you know, Pixar made Bugs Life and then there was another company uh, that made the movie Ants. Why did they were both about insects? They're both computer animated films. Why did one film do better over the other? And it really is because the uh, the one that had the best story. And the same thing goes with somebody making a, a pitch or presentation. Whoever mm-hmm. uses story the story techniques that have been working for thousands of years is going to win. It does make it very harsh of. Not the best story loses. Well, but, yeah, that would have been a very um, different book, right? I mean, here I am. Yeah. I, I feel like I'm a little bit on the receiving end of this. And Howard, I know you can relate to bring it back a little bit to higher ed. As as a, a faculty member, I happen to be uh, recently of an institution whose story lost. And yeah. as of, uh, let's they see, no longer as we exist. record this, it's gone. Like, they just turned off our email. And that was one of the most bittersweet, uh, not even bittersweet, it wasn't bittersweet. What am I talking about? That was one of the most ridiculously horrifying, you know, and and deeply sad situations that that I feel like we could come up. But they didn't figure out, ultimately, right? They did not figure out how to pivot the conversation to produce something where they wouldn't have to say, we can no longer be a viable entity. Right. And, you know, it doesn't get much bigger than that, Matthew, for a university or college to close because they haven't figured out their story. And fundamentally, wouldn't you agree that it's ultimately they didn't figure out their story? You know, and it's not only figuring out your story as a company or brand, but even more importantly, how to land the audience or your students into their story. Right. Mm. You know, it is important for us to be able to tell, you know, the story of our CEO, our leaders, of the the visionaries at our company. But really the most important thing is that you're landing other people into their story if they go to your college or they buy those pair of shoes um, or that car, right? 
you want to paint a picture for people of what their story is going to be like if if they want to work with you or engage with you. Yeah. And this, so this begs the question that many higher education leaders are either blind to or ignore, partly because they don't have to or they think they don't have to, is there's a high degree of resignation on campuses. Now, nobody wants to admit this, but it basically shows up, I'm going to keep my head down, do my job. But if you really dig a little bit, I can tell you that a lot of people I work with at, at all levels in an institution, at multiple institutions, there's a sense that there's nothing that we really can do that can affect a change. And what I'm really curious about and want to find a way to produce in these leaders to shift that, to open that up is how do you get people out of resignation? Now, the, st the, the work you do in telling a story for a movie has this roller coaster element. And I love that idea that you really are touching on the endorphins, right? You're trying to produce this really positive mood, but then a negative mood. And you you pull them back and forth until you end to where you're trying to end up. When you have resignation show up, what's your sense of what you have to do to get people to shift that mood? When it comes to getting people to change or go through a transformation, we don't we don't usually like doing that. We're we're either lazy or it's too difficult or what if we try something new and it fails? Will we look foolish? And really, the best way to get people to try something new, to be able to see something in a, in a, a new and different way and want to jump on board with it, is if they hear or see stories of how other people have tried something new and it worked. Mm, you right. know? Especially yeah. if the people are in a very similar place as you are in your life. I'm in my mid 40s. I have three kids. If I see or hear uh, a story of somebody that's in my same place in life trying something new and they had a success, it's like, okay, it worked for them. It should work for me. Yeah. So when I'm putting together a story, you know, I want it to be entertaining. I want it to be inspiring, but I really do hope that through it, people learned something and they were moved to look at their life a little differently. And even if the character on the screen is not a, uh, a representation of who you are, you, you use these universal themes that everyone can connect to, like, you know, birth, death, love, love lost. And people can connect with it. And so many times I have people come up to me and share with me how a Pixar film changed their life. that kept them and their wife married. Um, things like that. It's, it, you know, it's very moving and humbling. Well, you know, you, you've branched into uh, the work world and helping teams be effective in storytelling. And I've been doing that for years, not not with the background and skills that you have brought over your lifetime, but in the way of just having been in this industry of education and and continuing to look for ways to produce something that will emerge that will produce something for others, right? That it actually creates a new energy. What have you discovered that is the most challenging thing about working with individuals who find themselves in a workplace and they have to work with others and there's bureaucracy. And I would say most people, at least my experience, most people do not think about themselves as a storyteller. That there's a that there's a sense that, you know, there are good storytellers, but I'm not one of them. How do you help them shift that that self assessment? Yeah. So you know it's it's like when we were all kids. We were all writers and we were artists and we were singers and actors and actresses and we were all creative. And then we turned five in an elementary <laughs> school. Yeah, we get in middle school, high school. And then all of a sudden it's kind of like I'm not the creative one. You know, Alex, he's the creative one or Valerie, she's the creative one. And then you just start to remove yourself from that's not who I am. And, and really, the people who are the best communicators at work. The people I would even say who are most of the time the best, you know, leaders at work are ones who are still good storytellers. 
And I think the challenging thing I see is that, you know, some companies are a little bit leaning towards being a creative company. And then others get a little more analytical, you know, like a data analytics kind of company. And they say, how can I find anything creative or storytelling like in my job? But for me, I see that almost any business, you're, you're, you've got to be a good communicator. And, and yeah. if, if all works out for you, a good leader. And being able to share what your company is about and what you're trying to, you know, share with the world, a product or idea, you use elements and techniques of storytelling to be able to make it clear and concise and not just be about the facts, but to find an emotional connection with people. You know, I mean, you look at uh, like a financial institution, you would say, oh, boy, that's pretty boring. But a financial institution is not just about helping people make and save money. It's about helping people gain financial freedom to be able to do, you know, all those other dreams they have in their life. I work with Charles Schwab a lot and, you know, their tagline is own your own, own your tomorrow, which is great. It's not about, they're not saying, you know, make more money. It's, it's financial freedom to be able to own your tomorrow. Right. It, it, it taps into a deeper concern that people have that if we're selling products and services, we're often thinking about how do we sell this versus what's the concern yeah. that the people we're trying to impact, what do they have? So that, that statement speaks right to that. And I find that the companies and products that attract my attention the most are ones that are distru- disrupting the ordinary world of that product or industry. So like Uber or Lyft to taxis, right? Something, it, it, it created a change. And it took a problem that was out there and said, here's an idea on how to make it better, right? I love, uh, that's, those are the kind of ideas I think I'm attracted to and other people are. But then we need to be, you know, have these endorsements and testimonials to be able to inspire us right. to say, okay, I'm going to jump on board with this and try it out. Yeah, and change gets our attention. If the change means I have to change. Yeah. Where I met you and the work that I'm doing is in education. And you mentioned Steve Jobs in your talks and in your book. And you say that because he takes his audience on an emotional roller coaster ride when he talks about a device, an iPhone, to be precise. When I think about college universities, they're terrified of even considering bad news let alone even acknowledging it. So so can we workshop something right now? Okay. How would you adapt the same emotional roller coaster strategy he used for the smartphone to a college campus that is about to unveil a huge transformation that will impact the university itself, community, potentially the entire state? Like they're that they're looking to offer something that is Beyond what they they currently offer to speak to a different audience, you know, it could be first generation. We are really going to impact first generation college students and we are going to transform the number of first generation college students we have from 3% to 20. Is it necessary to do that emotional roller coaster to get people to step in? Well, if you look at how Steve did it when he introduced the iPhone, he started off by getting people really excited. He told, you know, he said something funny in there also to be able to release some oxyto, some endorphins to be able to, you know, put people at ease. But he basically started off by saying, I have something I've been working on for years that's been the most exciting project I've ever worked on. So he's already hyping people up. Like, what is it? Right? He's building up this anticipation and uncertainty, which is dopamine. Show us what it is. Then what he does is he says, we have created a smartphone. So he's he's come right out. He said what we've done. But then the very next thing he does is he takes it down to what is the ordinary world of these smartphones. So for you guys, you first want to start off with how excited you are of this this new way of of doing school, right? This 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 uh, new plan you have. But then I would immediately go down to, 
what is the regular world of universities like? The thing that Steve did was he wasn't BSing anyone. He basically just went through and, and said, you know, those regular smartphones out there, they, um, they're not smart. You can't get on the internet on them. They uh, have a stylus pen. They're really hard to use. And they're really difficult to put applications on. Now, he didn't say that was all at once. He went back and forth. He'd share what was something lousy about that smartphone. And then he would share how their smartphone would make it 100 times better. And he kept going down and up, tension and release. And so for you guys, whatever is lousy about universities, right? Well, you would want to go back and forth of what is not working and then how we're planning to fix it. Well, it's interesting. I, mean, I was in a conversation today with a executive vice president, and, and I have a talk that I'm giving. I have this video, this animation that talks about that for people who are truly resistant to your idea, we need to respect them. You need to listen to them, but you need to ignore them. And she said to me, you know, you might not want to say ignore. And and because that, mm. and, and I know exactly what she meant. Because it's almost like too soon that that the nature of working in an education environment is that everybody thinks that they should be involved, not just in every conversation, but very often every decision. I mean, this is part of the dysfunction of education institutions, is that the decision making isn't clear. That in itself produces a certain mood on campus. So if you want to go out and tell a negative story, I can tell you the reason why no one wants to speak those things is like like we need – we're going to move forward on something and the faculty, this is your role in this, is because the faculty may have a different view of what their role is. Mm. So there is a lack of trust – that exists in the higher education between the leadership bodies and faculty, administration, trustees, that, that seems to me to be a, a, a major impediment to producing, uh, moving together towards something. So when you have lack of trust, it seems like you could have a great story, but I'm not resigned, but I'll tell you, I, I see I see this lack of trust as a foundational challenge to be able to produce something that the storytelling could really make a difference. Yeah, you know, it's like I, I know even when I'm working on a film with different writers, you have to leave your egos at the door. Yes. You know, and, and <laughs> everybody is working towards making the best film or fixing the problem together. Well, that's the brain. That's what I read about the brain trust. Yeah. Right. right? Yeah. Just describe that for our audience, this idea of a brain trust and what showed up when they came together. So like the context is this is at this is when you were at Pixar. Yeah. So, you know, what what happens is at most film studios, the executives, um, the people who are not necessarily directors or writers, but the executives, they're the ones that make the final choices. And then they end up dictating what should be done to the creative people, uh, to, uh, that the creative people should do. Um, at Pixar, that formula was turned upside down. It was the um, creative people, the directors, they were the, the ones at the top that called the shots, basically. And the executives and the producers, they were there to support them. To be able to protect which is, them, which which is unusual, right? It is very unusual, and because you told me stories about where in other places you got to run everything by them, and they really have no clue how to create a story. Yeah, you know, one of the things we would do is that if there was no creative accountability with these directors, then you know somebody could go off on a tangent, create something that they thought was awesome, but it didn't land with the audience, right? So the brain trust was basically every one of these directors would have to pitch their story to the other directors and writing team, and people would give candid feedback. It would be honest. It would be kind. It would be candid uh, or with candor. You know, it's hard. Creative people getting feedback. Um, you have to leave your egos at the door. And we really saw that in this brain trust group that it, it actually made the films better when we got feedback from the other directors and other writers. Yeah, but very interesting. It's about not just giving the right feedback, but it's it's taking the right feedback. You know, just because someone doesn't like your idea, it doesn't mean they don't like you, right? right? 
you can't take these things personal. I love that you bring this back to leaving ego at the door. You know, Pete, it seems to me that this is a critical idea that if we're going to do any initiative at an institution, that's the conversation out of the, out of the gate. Are, is everybody in this room willing to let put their ego aside? And, you know, it's very often I have yet to do that. I really asked I recently I asked a group, what does it mean for you to bring your best self here? And it was a group of faculty. And they finally stepped into this. That's different from uh, leave your ego at the door and to even get people to explore oh. what that means. Uh, yeah, and I would I would suggest that to a lot of people when you say what does it mean to bring your best self or bring your best self to this meeting, that involves bringing a heavy dose of ego, right? Because my best self uh, is it happens to be sitting on my the, my own shoulder. Yeah, right. you know, bringing your your best self and leaving your ego at the door. I think it, it's it is about being the real you. People appreciate it when you are the real you, but there has to be humility in there. You know, well, right. And people appreciate that. If you share what's actually going on in your industry that may not be so great, people all of a sudden connect with you because you're being authentic. You're being human. And it's it's relatable and it's honest and people will listen, you know, and that's a big part of storytelling, you know, is being authentic, being vulnerable. And what you're doing when you are being honest and vulnerable and speaking from your heart is you know, you, you are, um, you know, releasing that oxytocin, which ends up making people have empathy for you. They have, they have, they bond with you, they connect with you, they trust you. And that's one of those, you know, storytelling techniques we use all the time to get the audience to like the characters as we release that oxytocin to create empathy. Yeah. You know, it's interesting as a, as a non- uh, m movie guy, meaning I, I, I don't, I'm not invested the same way you are. And I know Pete, you're very invested in movies. It's very interesting to think about movies and liking characters and th the subtle difference between liking a character and feeling like you're seeing something that is either cliche or is something that is not authentic. It's like oh, you, that you could already see. That's where Up was so amazing. Pete and I talked about this, you know, that in the first three minutes for a children's film, that that it goes through what it goes through, and it and it felt like it surprised the audience, in my view. Well, you know, you always when you're thinking about authenticity in in storytelling or doing a presentation, it's you're right. You want to avoid cliche. You want to avoid being saccharine and you want to be sincere. You want to be authentic. And that means that you have to open a little bit of yourself up to people. And we, we get scared about that. But the thing is that those are the best leaders and the best storytellers, the ones who can be a little bit, you know, it can be more sincere and open up. And sincere doesn't mean weak. See, I think when well, when people open up, I think there's some people that interpret showing themselves or whatever you mean by authenticity, yeah. that it comes off like the, the, the fear is that they're not going to be able to lead. They're not going to be able to direct. And, and I think that it, it's a risk for some to show that. You know, it's an example of the question is, can this be learned? You know, what's your experience about this? Can this, can this way of being be learned? Well, the thing is that when you watch a, a hero in a film, you like the hero not just because they succeed all the time. You like a hero because they fail as much as they succeed. I mean, if you truly look at the great heroes um, from Star Wars or Lord of the Rings or um, Indiana Jones, how many times does Indiana Jones fail in Raiders Lost Ark? It's the like whole movie. He literally fails yeah, the whole movie over and over again. But the thing is that the reason why you like him is because, yes, he succeeds sometimes, he fails sometimes, but he just never gives up. No matter how many times he gets knocked down, punched, pushed, shot at, he never gives up. And that's what we truly like in a hero and a leader is someone who doesn't give up, but they're honest. They share their flaws as well as their strengths. And all of a sudden you're like, yeah, I've been in that situation too. But a leader or hero just never gives up. 
I, you know, I've got to bring back to another Pixar thing. This is uh, uh, Bob Parr, right? Mr. Incredible. This is the thing I think about as a leadership parable, that here is a character in a movie who is vested with great physical prowess. He has great power. And due to politics and due to conditions that are beyond his control, he cannot use that power. He cannot. Yeah. He, he's forced to, to live in secret. So I look at our at our own leaders. I look at my own, you know, institutions situation. And I think this is this is one of the things that that we were un- unable to navigate. As soon as we lost trust with one another, uh, it, rather than sitting down and figuring out how to in, engage in a discussion around that that would rebuild around trust that would rebuild around the narrative we were trying to create for the institution it, the whole situation brought out the very worst uh, i may be coining a phrase siloification right it, we mm. became the most divisive more divisive than it has ever been you know with faculty against administration against staff uh, and, and it it really uh, allowed us to see part of the sort of the darkest of us because we weren't able to sit back and say hey collectively we are vulnerable what does that mean collective responsibility is different from finding out who is at fault and and in each one of these cases, I would imagine the leaders you talked about, uh, the the conversation is: Are we willing to get you know an example of of a place that really turned it around after the breakdown of closing was Sweetbriar, you know the the rural campus in Virginia that figured out that we are going to figure this out moving forward together, even though we're being told that we can't move this thing forward. So there's an example of. Rising up after a big failure, where the trustees say that's a great example. Yeah, people they they appreciate when you share the real you. They don't look at it as a weakness; they look at it as you're one of us. So, what, would that, what does that actually mean? The real you, like for you, if you're in a not as a coach and a consultant you are now, but when you were at Pixar, what did that mean for you to produce show up that way? Well, I mean, first off, when I share people kind of my journey working at Pixar, you know, after working on uh, Toy Story as an animator, um, you know, I was working there for almost a year and then they shut down the whole production. Um, the Disney company decided that that they didn't like the direction of the story. And I had left continuing to be able to work on The Simpsons as an animator to in Hollywood, moved to the Bay Area. And now all of a sudden I have no job and I couldn't go back to the Simpsons that my play, my spot had already been taken as an animator. And, um, so I worked at uh, Nordstrom rack picking up shoes for about four months. I mean, that doesn't, that sounds pretty weak, but, <laughs> but haven't we all had some lousy job along the way where we were like, all is lost, but, during that whole time, I just kept, um, you know, writing scripts, um, storyboarding and kept sending in my portfolio with the hope that the Disney studio was going to make Toy Story and we're going to work with Pixar again. But all of us, basically, the whole studio was shut down. But I think people like it when they get to hear these low moments in our life as well as the high moments. It makes the high moments so much more rewarding when you know what you went through to get to right. the high talk, moments. Talk about great archetypes. I mean, we are, as humans, are wired for stories of rebound. Yeah, we love the underdog characters, you know? And um, I mean, when you think of so many characters from, you know, Apple to IBM, Pixar to Disney, uh, you know, Uber and Lyft to the taxi industry, we love a great underdog story, you know? I want to make sure you have a couple of minutes to uh, tell people what they will get uh, in reading your book. Like what? So, so say a little, say a little bit about that because we're going to make your book available online so people can buy it. Well, you know, my book is about the storytelling storytelling techniques that I learned, I helped create at Pixar, and you know, I also come from a business family who owns toy stores. And so I was able to be able to take what are those storytelling techniques that have worked really successfully at places at Pixar and and at other studios in Hollywood? 
what are those storytelling techniques? What are these techniques that get us to sit on the edge of our seats, be able to help us retain information better, and to be able to root for a hero? When people think of Pixar, they think about stories that make people feel something. And there is a way to use those techniques in business. So in my book, I end up sharing what are those five principles of storytelling that make a great story and how you can apply those to your everyday job in business, whether you're a marketer, whether you are, you know, in HR, you're in finance, you're in healthcare. This is going to apply for anybody in business to be able to help them be a better communicator, to be able to pitch ideas better, and to be able to keep people sitting on the edge of their seats. And I also make sure that in this book that it's entertaining as well. Well, I had a chance to read through the book, so I got it online. And uh, it's what I love about it is the simplicity but the uniqueness of the ideas, right? There's a lot of storytelling ideas out there, but it, it's – I took away from it, there's a roadmap. You know, if you follow this simple roadmap, especially if you're a beginner in this domain, you can really accelerate something. That is that is a career builder too. It's there. There is a lot of books out there on storytelling for business, but, and I hate to say this, most of the people who have written them are not necessarily people who have worked on films or in storytelling. I mean, this is the first book that is from a Pixar story person. And what were those techniques and how can you use them for business? So this is really the first. I, it's it, it's really terrific. And I think, uh, Howard, I, check me on your experience, too. My experience is business leaders normally discount the value of story as something for creatives, and they aren't able to uh, free themselves of the yoke of pre previous, you know, experience. And I cannot say how valuable this is as a skill to communicating uh, from a leadership perspective, from a leadership management team building institution wide. It, this is an incredibly valuable thing to get good at. Yeah. And what's interesting, Pete, is there's divisions in education institutions which where it's sort of siloed. Here's the storytellers. Yeah. Which in some ways gives an excuse to the other people to say, you know what, we don't know how to tell we're gonna use those people. I get that, but I think the point that you're making, Matthew, is that if you're in a position to influence others, you need to learn how to tell a story yeah. that that moves people in a direction you want to move them. And and that there's a methodology. There actually is a method that produces that. And to your point, your years of experience of seeing what that is and how do you get an audience to be moved, uh, that's the formula that you've been following. Yep. And that's what's in the book. Yep, exactly. Fantastic. So do we uh, do we have any like uh, insider baseball kind of questions that he probably gets all the time? Like, what's your favorite? <laughs> what what don't you get asked? What what don't uh, you know? Don't. Obviously, what's your favorite movie? You know, tell us a story about Steve Jobs. Tell us something that you don't often get asked that you say. Why don't? Why doesn't anybody ever ask me this question? Yeah, that's right. Your favorite question you've never been asked. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, um, you know, I don't usually share with people that Toy Story was shut down, you know, yeah, and the, right. the hardship right. that went into hoping and praying, keeping your fingers crossed that I would get hired back and that the studio would keep going. And when I came back, then that was the beginning of 20 more years working at Pixar. Um, but, you know, I I would say that. Um, I, I'm very happy I was at the right place at the right time. And definitely my favorite film that I worked on at Pixar was Toy Story. It was the beginning. It was the first CG animated film. And I'm definitely very proud of that I was a part of that. And also part of Toy Story 2, 3, and yes, 4. So... <laughs> Yes, <laughs> you know I'm if, telling you, I, I as an a, 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 as an, an adult sitting in the theater with my kids, I wept hardest at Toy Story Three. Oh, Are I you hear kidding? You. I hear you. Uh, I know that's my job: make people cry. Ah, uh, brilliant! I'll have to show you at some point. I I, I went for Halloween as. Uh, 
as Woody, and my my son Max went as Buzz, and there's we have a little cutout of me Aww. that's like this big. I have to show it to you at some point. Oh, and this <laughs> made a huge impact. One last thing sure. here. So, if people watch your and listen to your TED talk, you'll they'll they'll hear the story about how you came to this from your childhood. Does um does your father admit that your success was his fault? This has been an interesting, uh, interesting experience for the both of us, I think. Fantastic experience. So we lost our guest. You we know, did. We, just, we lost our guest in, in somewhere. And well, I should add, it, it's because Howard asked him about his father. Yeah, I, I, I was the cause of this and the, everything went blank. But, <laughs> but, but then he called me back and said he had some technology thing going on, but it really was that I, yeah. I got a little too personal, I think. It was too personal. And the technology failed because correlation, causation and all that whatnot. But we, it was delightful having Matthew on the call. He can't get back on. And we were about at the end anyway. So we decided let's just wrap it up. So what were the key lessons real quickly? The key lessons are leave your ego at the door. Leave your and and I this is a point that I was about to add and I'm going to do it because he can't respond. Uh, <laughs> I think creative people in particular on this point of leaving uh, leaving ego at the door uh, tend to be to have a more difficult time doing that because they tend to be more sort of universally empathetic and really are, thrive on feedback of others. And so I know from my own perspective, it's enormously challenging to leave my ego at the door because I'm so deeply impacted by others' opinions of my work. And it took years to learn that. And well, and I think you're still learning it. I'm still learning it. And it's interesting you use the term empathy because I think it more like recognizing what your value is. And I think if you build a career around having a certain competency about being creative and then some idiot like me comes along and says, I don't like that image. Yeah. Like, what right. the hell do you know, Howard? I'm the expert right. here. Right. right. I've only been doing how... this for 30 years. Right. But that's, that's all right. Whatever you that's, think. But that's yeah. ego. Yes, right? exactly. So so this is an important lesson for all of us, and especially yeah. for leaders to say, you know, if you're the college president, what does it mean to leave ego at the door, but still leave? Right. That's the, that is the a central lesson for me in this conversation. Great question. It's a great yeah. question. We'll have to have Matthew back. <laughs> it would be great. I feel like we could literally pick it yeah. up in mid-sentence yeah. and, and try that again. But yes. we should also say, you can learn more about Matthew at Matthew Lunn, L-U-H-N story, MatthewLunnStory.com. You can find out all about the book, The Best Story Wins, How to Leverage Hollywood Storytelling in Business and Beyond. I'm telling you, I feel like this is an unsung skill in leadership. And don't sell yourself short as a leader, be a good storyteller. It's hugely valuable. And read the book. Read the book. Yeah. The so best we'll put a link. story wins. You don't we'll want to be a loser. You don't right. be a loser. That's not the subtitle. <laughs> That's not the subtitle. We're going to put the link in the show notes. You can find it uh, uh, in our show notes. Just swipe over in your podcast app of choice and you will find the link to this over in Amazon. You can pick it up right away. Uh, and thank you, everybody, for downloading and listening to this show. Head over to Tybalink to learn more about our work in education. You can subscribe to the show for free. Just click the blue button and we'll send you an email each time a new episode is released. If you like what you've heard today, please share with a friend or colleague you think might appreciate a new podcast in their library. On behalf of Howard Teibel and the long-lost Matthew Lunn, I'm Pete Wright, and we'll catch you next time right here on Navigating Change, the podcast from Teibel Education. Mm -hmm.